Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you're joining us from today in the world. My name's Sarah. I'm the Program and Event Manager at The Reactor in Sydney, Australia. Welcome to another Microsoft Reactor Sydney live stream event. Today, I would like to welcome for the first time Ajit and Patrick. So uh, just a bit of background on your speakers. So Patrick will be speaking first today, and he is an Azure Open uh, Data Platform Lead for APAC Australia, New Zealand, and India at Microsoft. And we've also got Ajit here who is a data and AI cloud solution architect also at Microsoft. Um, he's worked in the customer success team as a cloud solution architect previously, specializing in leveraging Microsoft Azure and its capabilities in data platform engineering, AI and data visualization to solve business problems. Uh, you'll see, so today's session, they'll, uh, you'll learn how to build your next app faster by leveraging Microsoft's Azure's fully managed services running open source. Uh, relations databases, but I will let them expand on that a bit further. Um, and you'll see that I've put into the comment section the check-in link. Uh, we have additional resources from today's session. So if you just enter the code 14782, uh, you'll be able to get those resources. This one will also be, you can see um, you're on YouTube right now where this is being also recorded. So the on-demand version of, will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after today as well. And we'll also share the link to the survey with the same event code 14782 towards the end. Do ask any questions throughout in the comment section and we will try and answer as many as possible uh, throughout and we'll leave a bit of time at the end as well but for now I'd like to hand over to Patrick who is presenting first so thank you so much Patrick and over to you. Thank you very much thank you for that introduction and thank you for having us and um, so yeah I'm, I'm based up in in Singapore and as mentioned I do focus a lot on Australia New Zealand I wish I could be with you in in Sydney that would have been awesome uh, but Ajit is based on uh, Australia soil and uh, when I hand over to him, he's going to share a real customer example, as you would expect. It's it's probably from Australia, although we can't call out the customer. But that will be a really interesting use case to make this real. But before we get there, I'm going to talk a little bit about the trends that we're seeing around enterprises and developers embracing open source based technologies, particularly on the, the database side. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of a feel of what we're seeing from a market perspective and then specifically uh, Microsoft's capabilities and offerings when it comes to these open uh, and NoSQL offerings that perhaps we are less known for than SQL Server. So if you haven't tuned into a Microsoft session for a while, we do a lot more than, than SQL Server these days. And that's what I am hoping to, to show you. Uh, but if we start with the, the trends we're seeing, there's no doubt that enterprises are embracing open source in general, uh, certainly uh, also when it comes to databases. And also there's a big trend probably over the last decade or so uh, to look at not only traditional relational databases, but also NoSQL databases. But if we start on the relational side, uh, certainly both Postgres and MySQL have become the top most popular databases among developers and among uh, the DBAs as well. They usually fight it out for the, the first spot in the DB Engines Database of the Year award. Uh, Postgres has now uh, picked that award up uh, three times and, and MySQL picked it up in, in 2019. So we'll see who wins in, in 2021, but certainly it's, um, it's a neck and neck fight between these two uh, databases in terms of popularity. Then if, if you believe Gartner, uh, which I do partly as a former industry analyst myself, uh, they are predicting that already next year, it's probably already started, uh, that seven out of 10 new applications that are being built are either going to be developed on open source or NoSQL technologies in, as a preference over the traditional proprietary databases. And of course, um, most things that are new are being deployed in the cloud. So uh, no difference with databases here. Uh, so with those trends, you can kind of see why Microsoft has been for over a decade embracing uh, open source. We want to be the, the home for your databases and your applications, regardless of the, the flavors that you prefer to use. If we then look at the developer's perspective, uh, according to the Stack Overflow survey, you'll see again, uh, MySQL is number one and probably leading with the web developers. The developers who started building their first website uh, on the LAMP stack with uh, MySQL as, as a natural part of that stack, uh, probably still quite comfortable with, with MySQL. And then more of the enterprise developers that are building enterprise uh, internal applications, they tend to favor Postgres for that as a real alternative these days to uh, traditional databases, whether that's DB2 or Oracle or even SQL Server for that matter. 
Then the other thing we see, first of all, Mongo, which has probably become a bit of a de facto standard when it comes to NoSQL, has been rising on that most used database uh, list. Uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, they're on, all on the top five now in terms of commonly used. But then if you look at what developers would like to use, you see also that there's a, a neck and neck race between Postgres from that traditional relational database perspective and MongoDB as a, as a NoSQL alternative. And then if we look at the flip side of that, what are the least wanted and, and most dreaded databases? Uh, probably not surprisingly, you'll see some of these legacy databases, whether it's DB2, uh, not a lot of young developers that are familiar with DB2, and Oracle is also uh, not faring that well in, in terms of popularity, as you can see. Uh, and I think that uh, sentiment is shared, whether you're a technology developer that want to build cloud native stuff, uh, they are perhaps not your first go-to cloud database. Uh, or if you're the one who has to pick up the bill, uh, usually Oracle and DB2 are part of the, the biggest cost items in, in most companies' IT budgets if, if you're still running those technologies. The one thing I thought was interesting here also is that Couchbase, which is a document type database, and Cassandra are actually popping up on the, the dreaded databases. And my personal theory here, I can't you know, vouch for it, but I do think a lot of this has to do with the fact that when you're using uh, NoSQL, it tends to be you know, big data, a lot of large Cassandra clusters to manage. So operationally, these databases can, can become a bit of a pain. And that's where I think a database as a service or a, a pass off offering has got a lot of value to add to remove as much of that operational burden as possible. And you can still use the, the databases to scale the way you need them to and to build applications the way you need them to. Uh, so then the other trend that we're seeing in general, you can say that relational databases are not necessarily growing. They're actually slightly declining at the expense of, uh, or for the benefit of NoSQL. And the databases that are growing are these two or three that I just talked about, the, the open flavors. So whether it's document, key value, or a wide column like Cassandra, they are the ones that has been growing almost exponentially over the last five, six, seven years. So if we then double click a little bit on the use cases for each of these databases, and we start with Postgres, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, in general, anything that you would traditionally have said, oh, I'm gonna build this on SQL Server, Oracle, or DB2, a lot of companies are starting to opt for Postgres as that option, both because obviously Postgres open source means you're not gonna be paying the licenses, um, and also because of the capability and innovation that's coming into Postgres thanks to the fantastic community uh, that, that Postgres has around it. It's really, by many, uh, arguably the most advanced open source relational data database in the market. Uh, another cool thing about Postgres is that it's really starting to blur these borders between what is a traditional relational database and what's a NoSQL database. So with the extensions that Postgres is particularly known for, it actually supports JSON, which is traditionally only supported by a, a document type database. And it also has another very interesting extension that I'm gonna touch more on called Citus, which allows you to scale Postgres horizontally. So both those capabilities, document capability and horizontal scaling is traditionally what NoSQL was known for. And now Postgres is kind of coming in with the relational capabilities and some of those NoSQL uh, features and, and capabilities as well, which makes it a really interesting alternative. Uh, it also has the PostGIS extension, so arguably it's the most mature geospatial database as well. And we're certainly having conversations, you know, uh, the example you hear today is, is from a bank, but certainly banks, insurance companies, healthcare, telecom, they're all looking at standardizing on, on Postgres and minimizing those legacy database uh, footprints. So it's certainly a big trend we're seeing in the database space. Why is it then that uh, Postgres has become the favorite uh, option for Oracle migrations? Of course, cost is, is kind of the number one starter when it comes to Oracle. How can I reduce my footprint? Uh, and even if I have a Pula, how, how can I have a better conversation at my next license uh, renewal conversation uh, to reduce that big ticket item on, on my IT budget? Uh, but also, as I mentioned, to, to get those cloud-ready capabilities and innovation uh, that exist in Postgres. But the real 
killer reason that Postgres is more popular than, say, SQL Server or any other flavor is the fact that the schemas and the store procedures and, and the database language between Oracle and Postgres are much more similar than, for example, moving from PL SQL to T-SQL is more uh, involved than moving from PL SQL to Postgres PL PG SQL. So the fact that they are more closely related means lower migration effort, which reduces the time it takes and the risk associated with the migration. Uh, this is just one example. The Austrian Railway, they moved their ticketing system away from an Oracle database. This was an 11 terabyte database that they moved to Azure Database for Postgres. And as they were doing that, usually we see companies doing anything with their database is often triggered by what they want to do with the application, right? So uh, they also took the opportunity to take this monolithic application and move it to a microservices uh, based architecture with Azure Kubernetes services. And I would say probably, you know, seven projects out of 10, we are doing an AKS application modernization and a database modernization kind of in tandem or, or one uh, closely after the other. If we then go back to MySQL and its sister database, MariaDB, as I already referred to, it really is the, the web developer's favorite database. Still today, nine out of 10 websites are running on MySQL. A lot of the online transactions, whenever you're paying for something online, uh, chances are it's a MySQL database that's taking care of that uh, payment transaction. So that continues to be a, a real sweet spot. Uh, if you're not as familiar with Maria, or if you are, um, it's actually the same founder, a, a Swedish uh, founder <laughs> like myself, who uh, first built MySQL. It got acquired by Sun. And when Oracle acquired Sun, he got very uncomfortable with you know, that big red giant owning his open source database. So he decided to fork his own database and turn it into MariaDB, uh, which is very similar to MySQL, but it's truly for the, for the purest uh, open source community folks. MariaDB has certainly been growing in, in popularity. And on Azure, we support both of these flavors, the community-based versions. Uh, and by the way, the reason these are named MySQL and Maria is because they're named after his, his two daughters. He even created a, a third database named after his son as well, MaxDB, if you've heard of that one. So uh, good for your pub trivia, perhaps. Now, the common use cases I already touched on, uh, it tends to work really well, MySQL, with a lot of the packaged applications for building web apps and e-commerce platforms. I've called out a few of them here. Uh, learning platform is another area where we see a lot of MySQL. And then gaming, particularly here in Korea and Japan, a lot of our gaming customers are running MySQL uh, on Azure as well uh, for their online gaming experiences. So those are really the, the key scenarios where we see a lot of MySQL. HSBC, uh, this is a great example of uh, an online payment app. So if you're splitting a bill and you need to pay your, your friend who took the care of the bill, uh, you can switch the money across to him on the, on the Pay Me app if you're based in, in Hong Kong. And that's running MySQL for that transaction. Again, it's using AKS as well as Cosmos DB. So if you want to get a better feeling for the architecture here, there is a, a video. Uh, of how they built it under the Microsoft Mechanics. So if you just go and search for HSBC Pay Me uh, on uh, YouTube, you'll probably find this, this video and you can see the overall architecture from HSBC. So my main point here that yes, Microsoft is still the SQL Server company that we are probably still mostly known for. And yes, if you like SQL, SQL runs better from a cost performance perspective on Azure, but equally, uh, we are equally supporting as first class citizens, these open source databases. And our key differentiator, if you look at other cloud providers approach to open source, is that we haven't taken the open source capability and forked it into you know, an Azure database and given it a cool name. It's literally the community versions because we know you're using open source because you wanna avoid lock-in. So uh, as boring as it might sound, Azure Database for MySQL, Azure Database for Postgres, uh, that's the name and it does what it says on the tin. It is truly community. If you wanna move back to on-prem or IaaS, you can do that with the, you know, the traditional MyDumper, MyRestore, et cetera, uh, to, to avoid any form of lock-in if you change your mind of which cloud you wanna run on. On the NoSQL side, don't ask me why, but we did go with a sexy name, uh, Cosmos DB, uh, which is the umbrella term for all of our NoSQL capabilities. But under that umbrella, you will find open APIs for Gremlin, uh, for MongoDB, 
and for Cassandra. With Cassandra, we even offer two options, both an API under Cosmos, as well as a truly independent managed instance of Apache Cassandra. And then in addition to that, we have our own SQL or core API that is also a document database, which is very popular for customers who are more comfortable with relational ways of querying your database, uh, hence the name SQL. It's not SQL the database, it, it's more the query language. So why database as a service? I think most of you understand the value of, of PaaS and DBAS is just you know, the, the database term for PaaS. Uh, when it comes to open source in particular, I think the killer benefit of that as a service experience is the support because that's one of the key blockers for enterprises to move to open sources. If I'm gonna run, you know, uh, a Linux uh, operating system and uh, a MySQL or a Postgres database, who's gonna support me when something isn't working? Uh, and traditionally in the on-prem world, you'd probably go to someone like Percona for MySQL or EDB for Postgres to pay for that uh, maintenance and support contract. But the beauty of a cloud-based service is because it's a first past offering, we are responsible to support you uh, for that service. So we're not gonna say, oh, you choose to deploy you know, this Linux flavor or, or that database flavor, we are only supporting the VM. In a pass offering, we are supporting the entire service. And if you find an issue where we need to go back to the community, we do have community contributors on our team as well that work very closely and contribute code uh, and bug fixes, et cetera, back to the Postgres community, for example. On top of that, uh, the benefits are you still have to do, of course, you have to make decisions about high availability, disaster recovery, uh, backup windows, etc. But instead of having to use a bunch of third party software and stitching this together yourself, you'd make a decision of do I want to use uh, Sonaware high availability? If so, I'm going to click a button and I'm going to flick a switch and I'm going to set my backup window. So the operational tasks are still there, but they're obviously extremely minimized compared to if you're going to do it all yourself or even in a, in a VM experience. And then on top of that, we provide some other value added services, particularly around performance, where we both have Azure Advisor that can tell you very common scenario on premise, you've over provisioned, you don't need this many cores uh, or this much storage, then you can simply reduce that. The advisor will tell you, you can move from a 32 core to a 16 core uh, SKU, for example. Uh, and from a query perspective, it can also advise you where you could improve your query for better query performance. And finally, with Azure Defender, it can also tell you about any suspicious activity or any strange logs against your databases, regardless of that flavor of, of database that you're using. So why would you choose to run open source DBS on Azure? Well, first of all, um, I do think that this community approach of not forking is super, super important and sadly <laughs> a differentiator for Azure. Um, the other point I would make is regardless of which database you favor, you're not gonna take your database and put it in one cloud and your application and the rest of the application and middleware stack in another cloud. So uh, the important thing is that we provide you a good experience from your database perspective, but even more so that we then integrate with the rest of the cloud native services. As you saw in most of my example, customers are leveraging on Kubernetes services. They might be leveraging on Azure Functions to trigger an activity or a response. They might be using Power BI to serve up data from the database to a BI reporting layer. So it's really, everyone is gonna have their favorite database. We wanna make sure that we have a good experience with that database on Azure, and that you then get the end-to-end -end solutioning experience on, on our platform, if Azure is your preferred cloud. Now, in terms of the deployment options you have, this is a differentiator for us, uh, particularly when it comes to Postgres. Uh, with both MySQL and Postgres, we offer two flavors of single-noded uh, Postgres and MySQL. We have one called single server, which was our first release. And I would think about that as the cost optimized SKU. It actually offers high availability, more or less built in for free, if you compare it to say an RDS or other service. Uh, whereas flexible server is our performance optimized SKU. We actually just GA'd MySQL at the start of this month and we're gonna GA Postgres Flex end of this month. They've been in, in development for about 18 months. So very stable releases. We already have big companies, including Austrian Railway that I mentioned running in production on flexible today, but official GA for Postgres will happen later this month. 
Now, uh, where we differentiate is with the hyperscale capability. And if you remember, I touched on Citus before. We were so impressed with that Citus extension that we decided to acquire the company that has built Citus. And we still have the founder and the CTO and all of the people who, who were with Citus with our team and helping us improve not only that Citus experience on Azure, but the overall Postgres experience. Uh, so yes, Citus is an extension. You can still run Citus on premise or in IaaS, but from a past perspective, uh, we will be landing things in hyperscale sooner than you will see them on, on other clouds. But we're still going to remain open, so we're not going to lock you into to Citus only running on Azure. But you will have a differentiated experience. Then, of course, we are the hybrid cloud, so you would expect us to have a hybrid solution. And if you're familiar with Azure Arc, it's our container-based way of deploying infrastructure and data services. When you can't deploy them in an, in an Azure proper data center, maybe you want to deploy them in your own data center or even in, in another cloud um, data center, you can do that with Arc and still get a unified management experience with the rest of your, your PaaS and Azure uh, offerings, which is a, a very unique capability from Azure. On hyperscale, very quickly, basically what hyperscale does, it it's, it's takes your database, and once you have grown um, vertically to the biggest SKU that you can find and you still need more data, say you have hundreds of terabytes of data or, or petabytes of data, this is when you would look to hyperscale as a way to scale out the size of the database. And we do that by sharding the database. You decide on the right partitioning uh, key and, and sharding strategy. But rather than having to man manually manage your, your shards, the hyperscale capability takes care of the sharding and distributes the data and runs the queries in parallel across these working nodes. So this is the concept of horizontally scaling Postgres, which, as I mentioned, is traditionally more of a NoSQL approach, which is why this type of capability is starting to become known as, as new SQL. It's taking the best of the relational and the best of the NoSQL worlds and bringing it together. A couple of examples here. Um, the uh, Helsinki Travel Authority, I don't know why, but we have a lot of traction in, in transportation with, with Postgres. Uh, they moved to hyperscale not because of the size of the database. I think it was still in you know 10 or so terabytes, uh, but more to improve the query performance. So once they distributed the queries across multiple worker nodes, they could reduce the query response time from minutes to, to seconds. And then a real killer use case for us, and I would uh, suspect one of the key reasons we, we got so impressed that we acquired Citus is that we're actually using it for our own Windows update service. And there you can talk about large scale. Uh, we're running 6 million queries on top of two petabytes of data on a daily basis. And the majority of these queries are being um, completed in, in milliseconds. So if you want to learn more about these use cases, I've shared some of the links here. And uh, I think we will also be sharing out a couple of links where you can find uh, the link to the stories and uh, how we built it videos if you want to follow up on and take a closer look. Another example here, since we have a bit of an FSI theme today, is BNY, uh, BNY Mellon. They are also using Hyperscale and AKS together. And uh, this is a, an analytics uh, use case uh, for uh, basically HTAP uh, real-time analytics use case where Postgres Hyperscale is, is very popular. Uh, there is, again, a micro, uh, Microsoft Mechanics How We Built It session. I think this video is about 10 minutes long. And it's really interesting to go through and see how they put together all of those solutions to build the, the capability that they needed. So that's a lot about relational databases. Uh, what about NoSQL then on Azure? As I kind of alluded to earlier when I showed you our overall database portfolio, Azure Cosmos DB is a multi-model NoSQL database. So uh, whilst other players have chosen to come out with you know, a document database with a certain name, a graph database with another name, et cetera, we decided to put all of our NoSQL capabilities under this Cosmos DB umbrella. But it's truly a, a multi-model uh, database Base, where we actually started out with the core or the SQL API. And I think back then we called it Azure Document DB. But since then, we branched out as we realized that there's a lot of other use cases for NoSQL. And there's a lot of preference for uh, developers in particular to use Mongo. They're familiar with Mongo. They're familiar with Cassandra or Gremlin. So we started then branching out with these open APIs for uh, all flavors of, of NoSQL databases that, that you can think about, whether it's key value, document, column, or, or graph type databases. 
What's unique with Cosmos DB is really the fact that we're taking advantage of cloud and pass or DBAS to provide you that true scalability uh, whilst reducing the operational burden. If you remember, I, I kind of called out Couchbase and, and Cassandra as uh, lower on the popularity ranking, possibly because of the pains of managing these type of large database environments uh, on premise. So certainly being able to give as much of the operational responsibility to the platform as possible is really the key benefit of using Cosmos DB. You can get truly limitless scalability and immediate scalability up and down. So when you need to scale up for your peak workloads, maybe you're a data streaming company, you scale up for fight night and you scale back down after uh, fight night or maybe Melbourne Cup is a, is a better example and actually a real example in, in Australia. You get five nines of high availability and if you need truly zero RPO and RTO, certainly Cosmos DB is the way to go. I often get asked, when do I go Postgres hyperscale versus Cosmos? It's really if, if four nines is not enough or below a minute or less than a minute uh, uh, RTO is not going to be good enough. You probably need to look at Cosmos as an alternative. So we do actually see, particularly in banks and um, healthcare and a few other um, companies I can think of that have like, moved their legacy mission critical applications, whether it's DB2 or Oracle, to Cosmos instead of landing in, on Postgres because they truly need those five nines. You also get guaranteed throughput at any um, size, and we actually guarantee both the five nines and less than 10 millisecond latency, provided that you leverage on the geo distribution that uh, Postgres can provide. So if you have apps that you need to have the same low latency experience in Australia as you need in Europe and Asia and so on and so forth, then certainly Cosmos can provide you that for geo distributed um, applications. There's lots and lots of use cases for, for Cosmos DB. Uh, sometimes I hear misconception that NoSQL is used primarily you know, by the Facebooks uh, or, or Googles of the world. And I think nothing could be further from the, the truth. A lot of the development started there back in the you know, internet days 10, 15 years ago. But today, it's hard to find a customer that doesn't have a use case for NoSQL. Anything where you have high volume data, different types of data, you need a real-time response time, perhaps you're feeding real-time data back to your consumers through a mobile app, then certainly you will be looking at Cosmos DB as that real-time OLTP engine. These are just a couple of examples of common use cases that we see in retail. Uh, it's often about product catalogs, uh, personalization and recommendations. Maybe you want to serve up um, a particular offer to a particular customer based on what you see they have been purchasing from you in the past. In FSI, a lot of real-time uh, credit approvals, fraud detection, and as I referred to earlier, modernization of these truly mission critical, critical legacy apps. In manufacturing, there's a lot of IoT scenarios where you're using other Azure components like IoT Hub uh, to feed data, and then you need to store that device information in a, a fast database that can handle all of the input coming from your different IoT sensors, perhaps in mining or utilities or energy, for example. Uh, supply chain is a common one also for logistics, and that's where a graph database fits really well to track and trace all, all your shipments or food processing ingredients, et cetera. And in healthcare, pretty similar use cases as we see in FSI, uh, real-time claims processing, uh, fraud detection, and modernization of those critical applications. So hopefully that gives you a flavor for where uh, you might consider using Cosmos. As you can see, there's, there's a lot of big logos that are using Cosmos, but I think my main uh, point I want to call out, it's certainly not only for the large um, companies, it's something that's used for anyone that has a near real-time use case. I mentioned migration. We see a lot of migrations from uh, uh, community-based Mongo or Cassandra. Uh, these are just a couple of examples. And for that, we have very good migration tooling and guidance on how you do that migration. Uh, with Cassandra, we just GA'd um, at Ignite the managed instance experience. For, so for those who don't want to move directly from on-prem all the way to the Cosmos DBAS experience. We have a managed instance experience, which is 100% open Apache Cassandra, uh, that you can still offload a lot of the operational pains. You can do that scaling up, scaling down, if you're a media company, for example. And you can even use it as a way to 
um, do your DR into the cloud if you still want to keep some of your Cassandra clusters on-premise. In fact, the way that you would replicate from on-premise to the managed instance is actually the approach you would most likely take for a migration to, to that managed experience as well. So just to sum it up, uh, we know everyone has their favorite database. And at the end of the day, it usually comes down to skills and familiarity. So my main point is, yes, we still care about SQL and we're developing SQL. Um, but we care equally about open source and NoSQL databases, whether you're looking to migrate existing uh, things like Oracle or DB2 to an open database or homogenous migrations, for that matter. Whether you're looking to modernize an application or build a net new application, we, we do offer uh, the capabilities that you would be looking for, regardless of what your favorite flavor of database is. Uh, I think you will get the links to some of these articles. I've tried to summarize a lot of the customer references and the use cases and best practices in a couple of articles because I tend to repeat and reuse that in a lot of my one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I reference it for, for, for my personal benefit. Uh, so I thought I'd share that with, with our partners and, and customers as well. So hopefully that's given you a flavor of what we offer. I'll hand over to Ajit now to make it more real with a, a real use case and a real scenario. So over to you, Ajit. Thanks, Patrick. And hi, all. It's good to be speaking with you today. Uh, my name is Ajit. Uh, as um, Sarah mentioned earlier, I'm a cloud solutions architect, and I'm based right here in Sydney. I'd like to speak to you about a real-world scenario that made use of some of these technologies that uh, Patrick spoke of, as well as other tooling from our wider Azure portfolio, which also leverage managed open source technologies underneath the hood. So this is a real-world implementation of a stream processing uh, solution. Uh, let me walk you through the core component tree that was involved in building the solution, uh, starting with uh, Apache Kafka. Those of you who worked with uh, streaming solutions, certainly the, the high-end streaming solutions, uh, would have almost certainly leveraged Apache Kafka as the streaming bus. Uh, Apache Kafka is an open source um, distributed uh, uh, streaming bus um, that's leveraged widely across the world, uh, potentially um, thousands of companies. Uh, certainly, in my experience, having worked with uh, with a few, uh, Apache Kafka is almost the de facto choice when it comes to that, that core uh, component of your streaming infrastructure. You have uh, the opportunity of either going and building a, a Kafka cluster uh, on any public cloud or on-premise, or leveraging Kafka as a managed service within Azure through what's called Azure Event Hubs, which is a PaaS service which is available in Azure. Um, by leveraging Event Hubs, uh, you simplify the deployment of Kafka to effectively make it a, a zero code setup for an enterprise capability. You can script that up as uh, infrastructure as code. Uh, it is a fully managed service. We manage it, we guarantee SLAs against it, uh, and we offer multiple tiers on it as well. So, should you want to scale from uh, you know, a, a megabyte a second all the way through to uh, five gig gigabytes. Uh, you certainly have different tiers available to you. You can start with the basic tier and work your way up to a dedicated tier if uh, if you're looking at processing that high-end uh, streaming workload. Uh, you can certainly ingest um, and, and make your migration to the cloud a lot simpler with event hubs for Kafka as well. Uh, you can leverage other capabilities that come with, uh, with Azure event hubs, such as being able to also offload uh, the event streams as they, as they onboard into Kafka to object storage in Azure Data Lake Storage uh, through a feature called uh, Event Hubs uh, Capture. Uh, you can certainly leverage the capabilities that you would expect with the PaaS service, uh, the uh, automated uh, scalability. Uh, there's capabilities such as uh, auto inflation, so that, yeah, as Patrick alluded to, an example of you know, having Melbourne Cup uh, lets you let the service itself scale up to meet the demand and then uh, scale back down as the as the, as the demand subsides. Uh, being a, an Azure service, there's certainly first-class integration back to the rest of the Azure security stack, uh, whether that's through uh, you know, log analytics and the rest of the stack in Azure Monitor, uh, Azure Security Center, and Sentinel. Uh, the service itself is also, um, there are SKUs within the service that are available uh, from a zone redundancy perspective. Uh, in fact, we just launched the Event Hubs Premium service in general availability as part of uh, Ignite. Uh, that is certainly something you should be looking for uh, building, uh, in, uh, looking to build into your solutions uh, from a resiliency design perspective. Then moving on to uh, Cosmos DB, uh, Patrick covered Cosmos DB in a lot of depth. Uh, the solution that I'm about to speak to you about leverage the Cassandra API. Um, 
And so I'll speak about why Cassandra was chosen. Certainly, uh, being a, a multimodal database, as Patrick alluded to, you have access to the many APIs that come as part of Kronos DB. In this particular solution, Cassandra was leveraged as the, as the event store. Uh, there's value in leveraging Cassandra from many perspectives. Firstly, it is a column family store. So for those of you who come from, a, let's say, having worked with HBase, uh, transitioning to Cassandra is, is pretty straightforward from a usability perspective. Uh, Cassandra, from our perspective, we support uh, Cassandra in multiple SDKs. So whether it's uh, integration with it with a uh, document SDK or, or with Java, for that matter, uh, you will have uh, support from uh, an API perspective. Uh, you also deal with Cassandra as, as, as tables with column structures and data types against them. And you interface with Cassandra through a query language called um, Cassandra Query Language, or CQL. Uh, which makes it quite easy for developers to be able to integrate with uh, Cassandra as an engine. Cassandra is also really well suited for high I/O type workloads or high write workloads, uh, which is one of the one of the other reasons why it was chosen in this particular solution. Uh, Cassandra also comes with a capability called Change Feed, which I'll talk about in a little more depth as we get to the architecture slide, which makes it easy to respond to changes as they occur. The relational data store used within the solution was uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, again, Patrick covered PostgreSQL and the many stews in a lot of depth. Um, from this solution's perspective, what, uh, made the, what made PostgreSQL the app choice for the relational store uh, was the fact that it provided uh, the solution with the, the ability to extend through the many extensions that you can leverage. Those of you who work with Postgres, you will be aware that you can leverage extensions for auditing, as an example. Uh, so while we offer the the core service to you is certainly uh, in a place to extend it uh, should you want it. The service again is a fully managed service. Um, you have the capability of it being integrated with uh, you know other AI powered optimization initiatives where you can tap into um, uh, capabilities in, in, in terms of uh, threat detection and monitoring in real time. The service itself gives you a flexibility for control. Uh, Patrick alluded to the flexible service queue. Uh, which is expected to GA at the end of this month. If you're looking at designing your next solution using PostgreSQL, you should certainly be reviewing the flexible server SKU. Uh, it gives you a lot of additional capabilities that you couldn't leverage in the past. Uh, some of them are uh, being able to make your service uh, zone redundant. We're quite fortunate here in Australia to have uh, uh, multiple availability zones available in our East region. Uh, you should certainly be looking at um, a flexible server from a resiliency perspective. Also, other capabilities such as an inbuilt uh, connection pooling capability. We, uh, Postgres Server, uh, Flexible Server comes with an inbuilt uh, PG Bouncer connection pooler, uh, which is also um, uh, an additional value add and something that you should be looking to leverage. Uh, Patrick also covered the, the Citus extension in our hyperscale SKU. Should you be looking at uh, leveraging an MVP version of Postgres SQL, you can certainly leverage uh, that SKU available uh, in, uh, in our stack as well. Getting to Redis, uh, for those of you who are a little closer to the application stack and require uh, and have worked with um, applications that require an in-memory store for, for that sort of sub millisecond type responses from an app stack perspective, you would have almost certainly leveraged a Redis cache for it. Uh, again, as with the other services that I spoke about, you can either choose to go build uh, and, and, and work with uh, and install your own Redis instances and manage them or you can choose to leverage a path version of Redis in, uh, in Azure Cache. Uh, this lets you build uh, responsive, scalable applications, uh, lets you focus on the application itself rather than having to go manage and, uh, and guarantee the, uh, the SLAs which we do against the service. Uh, it is integrated with the rest of the Azure security stack as well. Uh, it also comes in multiple SKUs, so you can work your way up from basic all the way up to Enterprise Flash, or should you want to leverage uh, some of the advanced capabilities in Redis, like uh, the Redis time series module. The Redis cache was leveraged in this particular solution for those specific reasons as well, being able to provide an application that some millisecond type response rather than having to reach back into a persistent store. Then we get to Kubernetes. And again, um, if you work with the application stack and you're looking at a, or have worked with a container orchestration, you would have almost certainly leveraged Kubernetes in, in, in one of the public clouds or, or, or in your own data centers. Uh, AKS or Azure Kubernetes services are managed uh, managed uh, service offering uh, Kubernetes um, under, the, under the hood. 
Uh, again, with uh, with uh, any other service, we offer the benefits of PaaS um, as compared to having to go build your own uh, Kubernetes instances. Um, in this particular solution, you will see that uh, the applications that consume from the streaming bus leverage AKS as the platform from which they would operate. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like you to I'd like to walk you through the high level architecture of the solution, uh, and we work our way uh, step by step. Uh, what you see on screen is um, is a high level architecture that's based on a solution that was built. It also leverages other best practices, um, and it makes it a bit more generic for for uh, yourselves to include. Starting with the publishing layer, um, we see as we work our way from left to right. Uh, we can see that multiple streams can onboard into a Kafka Event Hubs instance, um, and that's done in Kafka through what's called Kafka Topics. Uh, event Hubs refers to them as Event Hubs. Uh, but within those, Kafka, you can have multiple Kafka Topics within the one Event Hubs instance, and you can have multiple streams onboarded, and you can have your uh, RBAC controls or security controls against those individual topics as well for downstream consumption. So while uh, you can onboard uh, selected streams, and you can leverage the same infrastructure to onboard additional sources uh, as your use cases grow. The next we get to the consuming pattern where we see the linkage between uh, Kafka and, as I mentioned, uh, AKS. So the solution leveraged uh, a set of uh, handcrafted services that were running within the AKS cluster that would consume from those Kafka topics uh, and publish to downstream uh, a Cassandra instance in Azure Cosmos DB, uh, which is used as the as the event store. Uh, being uh, a managed service, uh, let the solution onboard additional services uh, as and when needed, um, while just being able to scale the service uh, up as required. As we get to the event store itself, as I mentioned, Cassandra was leveraged uh, within Cosmos DB as the event store. The way Cassandra works uh, within Cosmos DB is uh, you create what's called key spaces, which are logical containers, and then you create tables under those key spaces. Um, and then you can have compute and storage provisioned against that particular instance as well. The instance itself can leverage advanced capabilities, such as um, being able to uh, scale up to meet the increased demand uh, and release that compute when uh, that demand subsets. We then get to the real-time processing uh, stream of consumption. So this is a consumption stream, uh, table number four. Uh, Cassandra offers a capability, Cosmos DB, I should say, offers a capability which is applicable to the other APIs, including Cassandra, called change feed. By listening into change feed, you can listen into changes as they occur to those tables within those key spaces within that instance of Cassandra. And you can react to them in an ordered sequence as well. You can choose to implement them in one of many ways. Uh, if you look up our documentation, you'll find a very simple piece of code. Uh, it's literally a few lines of code uh, with either a C Sharp or a Java application that runs a CQL query uh, that listens into those changes as they occur. And then applications can react to those changes in real time uh, without having to rely on any other, uh, any other, any other component. All of these components come with the service itself and all you need is a hook to listen into them. We then get to the batch uh, processing, uh, pro processing stream within the three consuming streams. The batch processing stream, uh, in this case, also made use of some reference data, which was stored on multiple platforms. So by leveraging data that's stored uh, in, in, in silos, combining them with data that's stored in an event store, a rich set of uh, enriched information could be written back to a data mark hosted in a Postgres database, uh, which let downstream applications consume that data in, uh, in a reporting engine. Should you want to leverage um, uh, any reporting uh, capability, whether that's you know, native capability in Power BI, whether that's third party capability in Tableau, uh, the solution lends itself to being able to leverage any one of, uh, any one of reporting methodologies that works best for you. By being able to leverage PostgreSQL, we have a relational data store that stores a, what would typically be done in a relational engine, such as building a, a star schema and have it, having it modeled in a way uh, that caters to a, ref, uh, a relational database 
with referential integrity. We then get to the caching stream, uh, and this is where applications such as websites, which require uh, that sub millisecond type responses, for being able to respond to, uh, let's say, events requiring a subset of data that will be hosted in an in-memory cache, rather than having to go back to a persisted Cassandra store, would leverage uh, an Azure cache for Redis instance. Uh, there are many ways to going about uh, working with Azure cache for Redis. There are very smart patterns that you can leverage. Uh, patterns such as uh, uh, being able to uh, populate the, the cache when there's information found to be missing so that subsequent hits from websites uh, would go back to the cache rather than having to go back to a, a store. Um, so it's called a cache aside pattern. There's also smarts that you can build in, such as if the cache were to fail for whatever reason, there's capability within the application to go back to uh, the persistent store for continuity. So hopefully that paints a picture of how all three uh, consuming streams were enabled using this architecture. That includes the real-time processing uh, capability, uh, a traditional batch-oriented uh, capability, which builds uh, a very typical uh, you know, data warehousing, data mark type solution for consumption in typical BI type workloads, as well as uh, a consumption of, um, of applications that require uh, a portion of the events uh, that are of high criticality through an in-memory cache. This particular architecture is now part of our Azure reference architecture suite as well, and we've made that link available to you as part of our collateral, uh, which you can reference uh, post this session. Some considerations and recommendations for you to keep in mind as you think about building uh, a solution of this sort uh, with the components that we just spoke about. Starting with uh, performance, um, with PostgreSQL, as mentioned before, um, connection pooling is definitely something you want to keep in mind, especially if you have applications that are initiating uh, a wide range of connections back to PostgreSQL. Uh, given the fact that we now uh, enable connection pooling through PG Bouncer in our flexible server SKU, that is definitely something worth thinking about so that you don't add another uh, point of failure to applications by building your own connection pooler maintaining it in IS format and being, uh, I suppose, responsible for it. The next bit you want to think about is a partitioning within Cassandra itself. So those tables that I spoke about within Cassandra, uh, when it becomes a data modeling discussion, are required to be partitioned using an appropriate partition key, which typically depends upon how applications query that Cassandra instance. An inappropriate choice of a partitioning key would almost certainly result in poor application performance. So this is where infrastructure starts to lead into a more data modeling uh, type conversation, where the infrastructure will, will only perform as well as a data modeling as a data modeling uh, um, effort that's gone into it. No different to what uh, traditional databases would do. Uh, the same is true for a, a NoSQL engine as well. Then get into a scalability uh, a consideration. Definitely review the different tiers available within an Event Hub's, uh, as Event Hub's service if uh, you were to be leveraging Kafka as your streaming bus. As I mentioned, we just announced the general availability of the premium SKU. It's definitely worth considering the premium SKU comes with um, added resiliency for uh, zone redundancy. Uh, it also comes with additional um, capabilities that might assist in a in a, uh, in a cost optimization uh, exercise. So it's definitely something worth considering. If you're looking at the highest end of streaming solutions, uh, you will certainly be looking at the dedicated tier, which is an isolated SKU that you can leverage in your solutions. I spoke about uh, Compose DB auto scale, uh, definitely something worth considering where the service itself instantly scales up to meet demand and then relinquishes that additional compute when it's no longer required. Um, it's definitely worth considering when you have very spiky workloads or when you have an anticipation for a really large spike uh, in case of a, a fight night. Uh, getting to a security uh, consideration, the majority of services that we spoke about uh, in our discussion today do come with the private link. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, private link lets you effectively make these past services part of your network architecture. Uh, which gives you that additional level of isolation and data exfiltration uh, prevention. So do consider the private link uh, as, um, 
as a capability that you should be thinking about when you design your next uh, data-driven solutions. And finally, with resiliency, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're certainly lucky in Australia and in the East region uh, to have a very good zones uh, enabled. Um, as I spoke about the fact that the Event Hub's premium SKU, the Flexible Server, uh, PostgreSQL Instance, uh, Cosmos DB are all uh, capable of leveraging availability zones. Uh, and so if you're leveraging these services in your architecture, uh, you should certainly be looking at using AZs as a way to bolster up the residency of your solution. I think on that note, we've got uh, 10 minutes uh, to spare. Uh, Patrick and I would be more than happy to take uh, any questions uh, if you've got uh, any for us. It's been quiet on the chat so far, but feel free to type in any questions. Hopefully you can do that in your, in your YouTube window or yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. As you will give everyone just another minute to see if they did have any questions come through. Uh, whilst we're waiting, just a reminder about the check-in link so you can find the additional resources there. You just enter the event code 14782 and we just put the link to the survey and also the YouTube channel. So if there's anything the uh, uh, the audience would like to watch back in those presentation uh, from the presentation today, they can do so on the on-demand version, which will be available straight after today on the YouTube channel. Uh, Piers, you must have answered all questions throughout your presentation. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, thank you to everyone tuning in. I think we'll leave it there for today. Uh, have a good rest of your afternoon, evening or morning. And we'll see you next time for another Microsoft Reactor live stream event. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ajit. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Bye-bye.